The world was facing peace and prosperity until a strange tower appeared. Along with that tower, there was a gate, from which monsters came out with the aim to kill and destroy everything in their path. Humanity quickly became tormented by the fear of becoming extinct, until a few minorities of them got awakened with strange and powerful power, calling themselves the players, the only hope for humanity. We follow the story of Kim Jiju, a delivery boy who feels depressed for not being one of the lucky people chosen to become a player. On his way home, he looks at a billboard, where he sees the picture of South Korea's latest hero, the 18-year-old Seok Woo Yoo, a rare player who possesses a unique ability. Unique ability users are basically the strongest among the players. Those abilities allow them to possess unimaginable strength. He arrives home and sees his postal box filled with letters. He checks them out, but only sees bills, hospital fees, his younger sister's school fees, and loans. After entering the house, Jiju asks his younger sister about their mother's health. She assures him that she's doing well, and wishes him a happy birthday while handing him a cake and a letter. He appreciates her gesture and thanks her, and she asks if he's going to read the letter. He opens the letter thinking it was written by her for his birthday, but he finds that it wasn't her who wrote the letter. He's shocked, it's from the player association, mentioning he awakened as a player, inviting him to join their ranks. Tears of joy start to come out of his eyes, as he hugs his sister while thinking their lives are going to become different and how he's going to save his mother from her critical illness. The next day, he heads straight to the association, where they teach them about the player system. First, he needs to open his information tab. He follows the instructions, and asks why there are question marks in front of unique ability. The association manager is shocked and starts congratulating him for having a unique ability. She further explains those question marks mean that his ability hasn't manifested yet. Seok Woo Yoo, the latest player from South Korea, overhears Jiju's conversation and learns he's a unique ability retainer. He offers to become Jiju's guide, and the two enter the tower through a portal in the player's association. After arriving on the first floor, Seok Woo explains about the 100 Goblin test. He explains that it's a test designed to measure the potential of players under level 10. Basically, the faster they kill the 100 goblins without skills, the higher potential they have. 4 to 5 hours means they have high potential. 2 to 3 hours indicates they have the potential to become rankers. High rankers clear within 1 hour, but unique ability retainers can clear it in 10 minutes or less. He quickly deals with the 100 goblins. He explains why he became his guide. He wants to create the ultimate player guild a guild that can surpass Angela, the current number one Korean guild. He explains he wants a guild filled with unique ability retainers, just like Jiju. Five years have passed since that moment. Jiju is seen fighting and slashing a goblin. During these past five years, he's been trying his best to improve his abilities and help Seokwu. But at the same time, he's still level one. He's the only unique ability retainer still doing the 100 goblin test, and also the only one who takes one hour to deal with a single goblin. He was supposed to be a chosen one, one of the strongest, but in reality, he's the weakest player alive. He then returns back to his normal life, being a guide for new players and going to his secret spot, where one goblin spawns every day, giving him a chance to test and improve his abilities. The goblin spawns as usual and Jiju tries to approach it with a surprise attack, expecting to one-shot the goblin's vitals. But the goblin notices him and attacks back with its spear, putting on a hard fight which once again takes one hour to deal with. Jiju returns to the association and sells the goblin crystal for $20, but takes into account the amount of money he spent on potions. Therefore, it's another typical day in his zero-profit life. He meets with his superior, Tishiko, who tells him that his last group decided to change guide because they heard the rumors about him being unable to level up. But at the same time, there's a specific group requesting him to become his guide. The next day, Jiju meets with the new newbie player group. The leader introduces himself as Seonpul Kim and tells that his cousin, Seokwu, recommended Jiju to be his guide. Everyone introduces themselves and Jiju explains they will be in the tutorial dungeon for five nights. They spend their time scouting and dealing with some monsters until nighttime. Jiju talks to them about the floors and respective guardians. They are basically the floor boss monster, which usually requires a whole guild or large party to deal with. They spend one day per floor, where Jiju uses several strategies to teach them how to beat monsters. But on the fourth day, he notices a sandstorm coming while the group is fighting some orcs and goblins. He realizes the boss is coming and tells everyone to retreat. He uses a smoke bomb to distract the boss and leads the members to a safe place. He tries to evaluate the situation and finds out that one of the members was poisoned by one goblin. 
he also notices that he dropped the antidote while running away from the boss, which leaves him with one option, go outside and use a flare to ask for rescue. He heads out, trying to avoid any monster on his path, and is almost reaching the top of a hill to send the flare up into the sky. His job is simple, avoid the boss and send a signal asking for help. That's until the boss simply appears behind him and smacks him against a wall. The smoke grenade drops onto the floor and starts smoking the area. He takes advantage and uses his gun to shoot his rescue flare into the air. He then starts running away and finds the door to the fifth floor of the tower. He never tried to enter the fifth floor because there's a trial waiting for him. He can barely deal with a goblin, so going into the new floor is pretty much asking for his own death. But staying on the fourth floor is also the same, so he enters the new floor door, because if he's going to die, then he must see a new view. The system identifies his entrance and confirms his information to prepare for his first test. The system notices his hidden strength and decides to adapt his test. He must hunt a dragon. No, it's a defenseless goat. He deals with the goat and the system increases the quality of his rewards. He then finds himself surrounded by black smoke and hears the rude voice of a young boy asking him if he is his master, demanding a name. He wakes up two weeks later in the hospital. Tishik explained everything, and that Sample's party is safe, but the Guardian escaped. After the conversation, he notices there's a problem. He cleared the fifth floor test, but he's still a level 1 player. He goes back to the tutorial zone after being discharged and becomes more famous than ever. He was once famous for being the guide who can't level up, but now he got a new nickname, the Tutorial Slaughter. The voice he heard before passing out on the fifth floor was his reward, and his unique ability named Link an ability that makes him synchronize with an ego, a weapon that can level up, enabling him to use its abilities. He's still level 1, but his ego, which can take the form of a ring or even a sword is already leveling up to 8. He named it Lu, and with it, he starts a goblin and orc massacre on the tutorial floor. It's been one month since he started his slaughter spree in the tutorial zone, and he starts thinking that he could barely kill one or two goblins a few days ago, but now, he spends more time collecting the crystals instead of fighting. Jiju then starts fighting again and slashes an orc. Lu's skills make him drain the monster's blood and level up. As Jiju's bag is full of crystals, he goes back and tells Lu next time. Instead of the tower, they'll try going into a gate. After leaving the tower, he tells Tishik about his plan to enter the gate. Still, Tishik advises against it, saying that the gates have been acting strangely lately. After leaving the association building, Jiju thinks that high concentration crystals, special items, and clear bounties are all in the gates, making gates more profitable than the tower. Plus, he needs to pay his loans, so he chooses to clear the gate and applies to a D-rank party. He meets the party leader, Song Su Ha, in the cafe and sets up the expedition contract and profit distribution. Two days later, Jiju gets inside his first gate, but finds his teammates quite strange. They're strangers to each other, only Song Su and a red-haired girl know each other. Song Su tells them to hold their positions as multiple zombies rush toward them. He tells the tanker to block them and then asks the damage dealers to attack them while he shoots zombies with his bow. They start having a hard time, as the zombie skins start breaking their weapons, but Jiju steps forward and slices the zombies in seconds. The group rests for a while and moves to the boss's room where Song Su starts explaining the boss's mechanics. Their fight begins with Song Su shooting an arrow, the tanker blocks the boss's attack, and the remaining damage dealers do their best to attack. The boss starts to prepare his mechanic, which he gets three times his normal defensive stats, making it almost impossible to receive any kind of damage. That's when the group decides to use Jiju's abilities to become their main damage dealer. He jumps to slash the boss, but receives a system message, informing that his synchronization rate with Lu increased, enabling the effects of the skills that he uses. To everyone's shock, Jiju's supposed normal attack ends up defeating the boss with a single hit, rewarding him with another skill, cannibalism, a skill that he can use to recover health by devouring corpses. Song Su tells everyone that the boss dropped an equipment item, the Dagger of Paralysis. He explains they will roll the dice for the loot, but the tank has other plans. He basically wants to betray the party with his colleague and steal the loot, trying to invite Jiju to his plan. Tanker and his friend rush to attack Songu, but Jiju abruptly grabs the tanker and puts him on the ground. Then Jiju picks up the dagger of paralysis and asks if he can take it as a reward for saving Songsu. Songsu asks why, and he explains the weapon level is low and Song Su is someone important, revealing that a random wouldn't need a strong bodyguard. They decide to part away, 
because Jiju wants to stay more time in the dungeon and hunt a bit more. He heads to the boss room and sees some light behind the wall. He uses Lu to break the wall, and the sword tells him there's another ego, just like Lu, inside the hidden room. Jiju goes forward and discovers a white sword. When Jiju grabs it, he hears a girl's voice asking him to name her, so he names her L. The place starts to fall apart, forcing Jiju to run away. He gets a system message asking if he wanted to go to the reward room, and he says yes. A moment before his teleportation, he caught a glimpse of a giant golden eye staring at him. After that, news started to spread that a sustained gate collapsed. There are two types of gates, sustained and unique. Sustained can be cleared several times after it resets, but unique can only be cleared once. Gates also have several reward tiers. Lower level gates give basic rewards, and high level gates give the good stuff. His reward for clearing the gate was 30 violet crystals and a charm of protection, which was used on his mother to reduce her ill condition. Plus, he used the money he got from selling crystals to move her into the hospital, instead of being treated at home. He then decides to climb the tower, quickly progressing through several levels until reaching the ninth floor. He starts to remember Syaku's words. Level doesn't matter, because, in the end, his unique ability will carry him, to the point where L reaches level 8. He then thinks about finding more egos to make him stronger, and there's an easy way, the item auction house. He does find an ego there, but it's the main item that is worth a few million. But he can't afford it because he's just like us, broke. At least he got $100,000 from selling his dagger of paralysis. On his way home, a gate suddenly appeared in front of him. He immediately reports the gate appearance to the association, and Tishik appears. According to the association's rules, the person who reports a gate appearance has the right to clear the gate within the next five days. If the person doesn't enter the gate, then it means he forfeited the gate, and it will be auctioned to someone or some guild. At the cafe, Tishik asks Jiju if he is confident in clearing the f rank gate that he found. Jiju confirms his decision. Then Tishik tells him to finish his preparations and meet him in four days. On the next day, Jiju decides to go out and check equipment to buy. But the cheapest ones are trash, and the best ones are too expensive for his wallet. Suddenly, his egos tell him to notice a nearby boy only wearing egos as normal clothes, claiming his grandfather is a great artisan. The boy claims his grandfather is a great artisan, so Jiju approaches him asking the kid to take him to his grandfather's store. Upon entering the store, Jiju notices every item in that store is an ego, but the boy's grandpa, Jichul H. Wang, tells Jiju that he won't sell his items to him, because he can't appreciate his work. Jiju starts reading to him the item's levels, names, and abilities, proving to the blacksmith that he's the one who can use his items to their fullest potential. The old blacksmith is smitten by it and allows Jiju to buy items from his shop. Jiju tries to link with those items but can't, but after some time, he succeeds in linking with the armor ego called Brunhart. Three days later, Jiju meets Tishik inside a training room under the Player Association building, where Tishik decides to test Jiju's abilities to enter the gate. Tishik suddenly disappears and gets in front of him kicking him away, proving that he was a previous expert high ranker. Jiju rushes to attack Tishik, but Tishik easily blocks his attacks and tells him to aim for his vital spot with all his strength. So Jiju concentrates and begins attacking him from all angles, but Tishik avoids all of them. Tishik then tries to punch him but Jiju's armor, Brunhard appears, blocking and reflecting the damage. Jiju still gets knocked back and hits the wall, but Tishik allows him to enter the gate. Later, Jiju enters the gate, just to find himself surrounded by wolves. If you want part 2, destroy the like button and subscribe, so you don't miss it.